Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Riverbank Zoo and Garden. It's nice to have you all back at Z Learning this morning. My name is Milo, and today we are live here inside of our Bird Conservation Center. Now, I know that a lot of you have seen this building before walking around the zoo. It's right across from our kangaroo walkabout. But honestly, a lot that goes on in this building is entirely behind the scenes, out of view, so you don't really know all the rumblings that go on behind the scenes in this building. But I gotta say a good morning to Walker and Maddie and Ella, Alejandro, Ven and Elsie, nice to see all of you. Mariana, nice to see all of you tuning in this morning. Good morning. We are going to dive in for an entirely behind the scenes feature. We're not gonna go out onto the public pathway this morning. In fact, it might start to rain outside, but we are going to stay nice and dry in here. But good morning, Maxim, Christina. Good morning, Sarah and Noland. Thank you all so much for still tuning in for Z Learning. We have a jam-packed week, and today I'm joined by a good friend of mine. Her name is Christine. In fact, here in a second, I'm gonna turn around the camera so that way y'all can say good morning to her. But she is gonna lead a private tour for us inside of our Bird Conservation Center. It's a mouthful, but we're just gonna call it the Bird Center today, so that way we can kind of abbreviate it a little bit. But good morning, Carson. Ben and Noah from Colorado. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, Bonnie, we missed all of you yesterday too, but I hope you all had a very happy Memorial Day and enjoyed the long weekend with friends and family. Let me go ahead and turn around this camera and say, good morning. Nice to see you, Christine. All right, so Christine, you are one of our many bird keepers that we have, but specifically everyone who's tuning in, Christine is our can I say primary keeper here in the bird center? So she is really kind of housed out of this building. And right now, Christine, where are we? Cause we're kind of standing in front of this window. We have the public out there in front, <laughs> but we are here. Let me actually take a step back. Cause I kind of was all in the mix of it. We're in the kitchen. We're in the kitchen, yeah. Now, Christine, I have to give you a shout out. It is spotless in here. <laughs> My kitchen does not look anywhere near this right now. Look at how clean this is everybody. Talk about a tidy space. Now I know we spent a bit of time in commissary getting to see where all the diets are made, but you have them all laid out right here, or not all of them. Right. All of them is what? How many do you make every single day, or how many are prepped? So there's about 145 bird diets that are prepped. <laughs> 145 every, day. every single day. 145 bird diets. That's wild. So we have just kind of a an appetizer out here, I right. guess, an yes, example. Yes, a little bit. So these are all from the bird center diet. So there are more that are used for like the flamingos and obviously the penguins aren't going to sure. eat this kind of food. Yep. Um, but there's a whole, you can see a whole bunch of different colors. There's a lot of different pellets. So this is what our lorikeets will okay, be eating. I was wondering, I was going to say, I kind of recognize that from last week when right. we were hanging out with Amy that kind of look kind of similar. Now, if you remember from last week, their favorite was the grapes and the blueberries. Yeah. Okay, but mm -hmm. what else do we have here? This is really red. So the color. dark red pellets. So this is our toucan mix. Oh, fun. So our okay. toucans and our arisari will eat this. So it definitely looks different from the other diets. Absolutely. So we have toucans not only on exhibit in our South American aviary, but we actually have toucan pairs that are behind the scenes here in the bird center as well. We won't see them right this morning, um, but maybe we should do a whole toucan feature because Riverbanks is quite well known for our toucan care. All right, going down the line, I see a big old nut, so, lots of other colors mm -hmm. too. So this is what our parrot diets look like, a lot of our different parrot diets. This is specifically our thick bill parrot diet. So you can see there's some fruits, some veggies, some seeds and nuts, and they're very colorful pellets. Now a shout out to our thick bill parrots. We have a, a pair, correct? We, we do. Have wrong. We have a, pair, a breeding pair behind the scenes. Um, they're in a different wing of our bird center that we're in right now, thank goodness, because they're a pretty noisy species. Um, but shout out to them, they're an endangered species. And we are hoping that that pair actually kicks it off and maybe builds a nest and has their own young here at Riverbanks. That's our goal. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's see what, uh, oh gosh. Okay, so I only see three ingredients in this one. That's kind of so unique. So that's a unique one. So that's not actually a bird diet. <laughs> so that's gonna feed. Wait our, a second, so not for birds. This one's for? For our mealworms and our crickets. Okay, so let's bring them on over so we can get a better view. So, okay, why are there bugs in the bird center then? So we, <laughs> we use bugs every single day. 
They're a favorite of many of our birds for food. They love to eat them. Um, some of our birds don't like the bugs quite as much, but the ones that do, it's definitely <laughs> a favorite. Well, that is such a funny thing for you to point out. I love that the, the bug diet, the mealworm <laughs> diet, was a part of the row because you've got to make sure that good nutrients are going into then, I guess, the nutrients that the birds are eating exactly. then, too. Yep. It's, it's kind of all the circle of life, you could say. So just like our birds are fed every day, so are our bugs. That is hilarious. Food. Okay, so what is this last So container? that's an insectivore diet. Okay. So insectivore means that they eat insects primarily. So it's a lot of... There's some egg, some protein in there. There's a little bit of fruit mixed in there as well. I was gonna say, I was noticing like the apples, the blueberries. Okay, so then you say insectivore. Obviously that doesn't look like insects. Right. Do they have other things added to their diet then too? Yes, so they'll get a lot of these mealworms and crickets added in. Gotcha. Okay, well that's a good point then too, because if we kind of look at all these different diets, these are all great examples. They're very colorful and beautiful. But these aren't the only thing that they eat. They, I mean, for example, we talked about the, the lorikeets. They obviously eat a whole ton of nectar. Yeah. That big kind of potion that we make for them on a daily basis. So this is kind of, let's the say the starter. The starter. Yeah. I like that. Mm -hmm. That's a good way to put it. So the starter diet, and then it goes from there. Now, exactly. those of you who are interested in the creepy crawlies, we talked about kind of the bug diet right here, the kale and the sweet potatoes. But there is a whole lot of bugs over here. I gotta kind of give a pan over. Take a look at all of that, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> that is a whole lot. Because we have a whole lot of different bird residents. Like Christine said, there's about 145 different diets made every single day. And they do include crawly individuals like our mealworms over here. Now, we had really talked about when we first got in here, those of you who are just joining us, we are here inside of our, our bird conservation center here at Riverbanks, and we're in the kitchen. It's very spick and span, and there's a very specific reason for that. You've already fed out everything this morning, haven't we you? We did, yep. So our wow. morning, morning diets are given out, and birds are nice and happy and full. So everything is pretty empty. The sink is cleaned. We are ready to go. And if I remember correctly, this is a little too early to receive the afternoon diets for next day. So you haven't even gotten the new delivery yet from commissary. Well, it looks amazing in here. Well, Christine, I'm going to go ahead and follow you into our next room. So we're going to go ahead and leave everything here in the kitchen and follow our zookeeper friend, Christine, from our bird department into what room are we in now? So we are in the brooder room. Brooder room. Okay. So known as our chick rearing. Thank you. I was going to say, so those of you at home who are wondering, well, what is a brooder room? It's where chicks can be reared. Now, those of you at home right now, there's no chicks in here right now. <laughs> there is, it's very quiet in here, but I got to kind of zoom in over here. We have a great example chick that cracked me up. When I walked over to the bird center this morning, I did such a double take because I thought this individual was real. That just goes to show the artistic <laughs> capabilities. This is actually made by one of our bird keepers, Melissa. She does amazing, is it needlepoint wool work? How, how would you, Needle oh, it's felting. felting. It's felting, mm -hmm. exactly. Thank you for correcting me. So tell us a little bit about this setup and the fake bird that's inside. <laughs> so this is an example of one of our lorikeet chicks. So that's one of the species we do a lot of hand rearing with. Sure. Um, we do a lot of lorikeets. Um, so we start them out in these smaller brooders. Yep. So we can add water, we put in filters, keep everything super clean for them. And we can also adjust the temperature. And we'll start out, a lot of our youngest chicks will start out as high as 95 degrees. Whoa, okay, so then these are truly just like warm areas for the chicks to exactly. stay cozy and mm -hmm. just worry about growing and developing. Exactly. Because I just actually saw a question. William H. 10 was wondering, where do you put the chicks? So is this an example of where they would go? It is. So we can set up a whole bunch of different nest type structures. Sure. Um, so we can do towel rolls. We can do the little knit cups like this chick has. Do you today. mind showing us a little bit? I know we don't actually have a bird in there, but <laughs> we'll watch it kind of reach in. And as Christine's doing that, William, that's a great question. And I do have to mention, even though we are getting kind of a close look at what an artificial setup would be if we were hand rearing. Our first choice and the most natural choice is for them to be parent reared. Exactly. So the parents do 
can do the best work. Absolutely. Um, they're the professionals. They know exactly what they're doing. Right. That's not to say that y'all on the bird team aren't <laughs> professionals. It's just Mother Nature knows best. Exactly. And for the parents to truly do all that rearing is ideal. Yes. So that's our main goal. We want to set up the, the adults, the breeding pairs, as best as we can possibly do to, for them to take over. Gotcha. Responsibilities. Well, and Anna, age 10, was just wondering, do we have any baby birds currently right now? So we don't, but we are hand rearing. Gotcha. Okay. So nothing in here. Um, we have had chicks this year. Okay. That have been successfully taken care of by the parents. Absolutely. Um, well, and those of you who have been tuning in on social media, you've probably seen those pictures, those videos. Um, they're actually individuals that have been out on Habitat. Our Edward pheasants are a great example, or our newest little additions from the other Asian aviary. Correct me on the pronunciation. Trogopans? Tragopans. Tragopans. Yes. Hey, y'all, I was really close. Yeah. That was really, pretty good. <laughs> this is our first time actually breeding that species here at the zoo. Um, and they've actually been out and about. They're probably, gosh, they're getting, woo, they're getting pretty old now these days. But this is a great example of a very small setup. Now, when we first came in here, I know I kind of panned down a little bit. You can see right under here, under the counter, where there's some heat lamps all set up. And I can see all these thermometers in here too. I was noticing 68 mm -hmm. on this one. Let's go ahead and zoom in really quick. This one actually is already set to 85 degrees if you can read that before mm -hmm. it focused differently. So these would be obviously for some of our larger individuals too. Exactly, so if they get a little too big, then they outgrow the brooders on top of the counter. They'll go gotcha. down underneath. Makes sense. Um, there's a little bit more room for them to spread, stretch their legs and kind of walk around. Sure. Um, a lot of our flamingos. I was just thinking of that. Chicks, Absolutely. Well, well I was remembering well. back to last year when we had five different flamingo chicks and all of them passed through this building mm -hmm. at some point in their life as they kind of transitioned, grew up. And eventually we're actually going to head to an area where once they were too big for this space and kind of grew out of it, they moved to another area of our bird center. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Let's go ahead and... <laughs> We're going to head on over into the next room. We'll follow you that way, actually. I was trying to scroll through some of our different comments. Oh, Christine, you got a big shout out from your friend, Tanya. Hey, Tanya, nice to see you tuning in this morning. <laughs> and Cindy, you're absolutely correct. That bird that we were just handling, is a, it's a fake bird. It was a, a felted bird, and it was a replica of a lorikeet chick? Yeah. Okay, so it's about the same size look as a lorikeet chick. Now, what room are we in here right now? So we're in incubator room okay so i can see we got a couple of big machines here yes, so these are all <laughs> of our different egg incubators so basically if we have a situation come up that we need to artificially incubate sure we will bring them in here um we, there's a whole bunch of paperwork we do a lot of record keeping on all of our eggs that come through here well, and when you say record keeping, mm -hmm. is that just for the temperature? Are you weighing them, measuring them? Like what kind of paperwork are we talking? All of the above. So okay, we, wow. we keep weights and measurements on the eggs. We keep, as you can see, we have our temperature logs on the side that we wow, do twice yeah. a day. So y'all, this is truly Modern. the science behind taking care of all of our animals. It's not just about cleaning up after them and feeding them. It's truly all of the specifications for every single species, including, I'm trying to go past the reflection, <laughs> including eggs. We actually have some eggs in this incubator right now, but we're gonna keep it a secret. We're not gonna tell you exactly what species those eggs are from today. We'll have to kind of wait and see because incubation can last anywhere from, what, 30 days to, how long is some of the longest incubation that you know of? Up to 70. Yeah. Wow. So I think the shortest that I've heard is 11 days. Oh, even shorter than mm -hmm. that. Oh, 11 days. Wow. Yeah. So depending on the species, there's, you know, it's very species specific. Absolutely. There's not a one size fits all well, for and incubating. Speaking of one mm -hmm. size fits all, <laughs> y'all are probably seeing this in the background. Talk about a range of different sizes. This is a great example of what Christine was just talking about where some species only incubate for maybe up to just 11 days mm -hmm. and then all the way to maybe a little over 70 days. So it's quite the range because there's lots of different sizes. Okay, I did just see a question come through. Jenny, are these real? Well, tell us. They, most of them are. So most of them have been cleaned out and actually filled with some plaster 
you can see right there. Gotcha. So, okay, so they are a real egg with they, no real chicks inside. That's correct. <laughs> okay, just to clarify, everybody, <laughs> these are not... Correct. These don't have any due dates of hatching or anything like that. In fact, these have a very specific role here at the zoo. What do you actually use these eggs for? So we will use, we call them dummy eggs. Sure. So they're artificial. They're yeah. not, not being incubated or anything like that. Yep. Um, and we will give them back if we need to pull an egg from a parent bird to incubate inside. We'll give them a dummy egg to replace it. Gotcha. So they keep continuing those incubation behaviors if they're still working on that. Um, you can tell, so these are definitely, this is a wooden egg. Yeah. This is a clay, uh, like a, just a clay egg. Yep. We can kind of make whatever size almost. we need. But a lot of birds, some birds don't notice the difference, but others will. So we have kind of a variety that we can use depending on the individual pair. And you got to get kind of creative too. And that's such a great example too of how we help our different bird parents to be successful parents by removing those eggs. It means that that egg then can get incubated properly. It can be monitored more closely by our keeper staff. Um, but I am seeing a couple of different questions. Tiffany was wondering, what is this big egg? So that big one, that's the ostrich egg. Of course, this is mm -hmm. the world's biggest egg. They are massive. <laughs> now, going down in size, the next door neighbor, what is that actually So from? that's a scenarius vulture egg. So they really do have all sorts of shapes, sizes. In fact, I'm noticing on these speckly mm -hmm. eggs right here, they're kind of very pointed looking. Exactly. So those are from some shorebird species. So some spotted dick ops, which we have in the birdhouse. Yeah. And some masked lapwing. So then by having kind of that pointy egg, if you imagine if it were to roll, mm -hmm. it's going to roll in a circle. Exactly. So it's not like a golf ball that, you know, if you just kind of move it a little bit, it's going to roll away. So it'll stay, stay right in place. Perfect. And you can see all the different colors. As far as camouflage, blending mm -hmm. in, the shorebird eggs are a great example. If you were to find that on a shore, you probably wouldn't actually find it on a right. shore. It's so well camouflaged in mm -hmm. with this environment. Now, I did just see a question come in. Connor, age seven, you're wondering what's the most endangered bird that we have here at the zoo. Instead of telling you right now, hold on to that. We're actually going to head over to another area here in the bird center in just a moment and we're going to actually check out some of our bird residents right here in the building but obviously these are all kind of these are replica eggs a great example though of all the different incubators now right now all of these other ones are empty there's no eggs inside of here correct correct mm -hmm. so these ones are ready if need be but once again obviously our first goal is for them to be with their parents right but and we'll even incubate and give the eggs back to the parents a lot of the time yeah so they can get the experience raising their chicks even sure if they're having a little problems with the incubation and then from that hatch all the way to raising mm -hmm. now some of this other stuff you kind of might notice from oh it's been a while now it's <laughs> been almost a it's been a little over a year actually um you might remember but elmer our rock hopper penguin that was recently hatched here at the zoo recently as in last year was actually had a cracked egg now christine was actually the <laughs> individual that glued him back together, put him in the incubator, and then eventually was hatched out. And what would you actually call this piece of equipment? So it's called a hatcher. It is a hatcher, mm -hmm. okay. So it's kind of like those brooders that we sure. saw in the other room. You can add some water to create a really humid environment and it can get really warm. You can set the temperature higher in here as well. So then if you might've seen one of our videos of Elmer hatching out or even our flamingo chicks. This is where the video was taken. This kind of this behind the scenes look that y'all were always asking for. Um, Zoe age eight though was wondering how many different birds do we have? Do you have about a range of number of residents we have? So zoo, zoo wide, I'm not sure the exact number. Sure. Somewhere around 300. Whew, okay. But how many do we have here in the building any given time? In the bird center, Right now we have about 16 different species and I think about 45 individuals. Wow, okay. Um, if we're bringing birds inside for weather or anything like that, it, Obviously can, it can range. Sure. have a big range. Well, and actually speaking of that, let's go ahead and follow you over into sure. that area. We're gonna leave our incubation area. We're gonna follow Christine down into a, a private hallway. Now this is where a bulk of the, thanks so much. This is where a bulk of the kind of building is. And we're gonna try to be a little quieter in here because we have a whole lot of residents 
in this hallway. <laughs> now, in here, you can kind of tell that there is a row of different habitats, um, different kind of behind the scenes housing. And Christine, we got to stop right we here, do. of course. We got a very personal looking friend that's wanting to say good morning to us. <laughs> Who is this? So this is our youngest lure heat chick that we have this year. Um, if you remember, it's been a while now, but kind of about a week, I guess, after our temporary closure started. Yeah. We took a look at a really little lure heat chick that was out on Habitat. And this is her. So she's very... She looks very different. She's very yes. grown up looking. Mm -hmm. So Anna, since you were wondering what was one of our latest hatchings, this would be one of them. Mm -hmm. So if you remember that post that had the kind of the white fuzzball looking of a bird, this is what she grew up to look like. She's one of our, our lorikeets. Now we're going to be joined by a whole lot of bird calling too, of course. Now this is just temporary housing. Um, where's her next stop over after this? Is she heading to another zoo or is she staying So here? she'll be staying here. Gotcha. So the plan, you can see she has a friend in there as well. So the <laughs> two of them are will be going out on the lorikeet habitat. Gotcha. Okay. Once so when, they're just a little bit older and ready to meet the rest of the flock. Gotcha. So a little mm -hmm. bit more mature, a little bit older, but definitely a species that you'd recognize here at Riverbanks. <laughs> I absolutely agree, Naomi. Beautiful bird. So let's go ahead and continue kind of down this hallway. Now, as we're walking down here, there are lots of different modular areas. And Christine, kind of tell us, why are they such an odd shape? So as you'll notice, these spaces are pretty narrow. They're about three feet wide. Sure. But they're very long. So they have kind of this long space and that's perfect for the birds to really be able to fly, do some distance flying back Absolutely. and forth. So it's kept obviously at a very comfortable temperature for them back here. Um, but they're designed specifically to allow that flight. They're obviously perching. Some of them you might notice are maybe a little bit more empty than others. There's not animals in every single housing, um, but we got some noisy individuals <laughs> that are hanging out over here. Some of our jays that are kind of flying all around. Now I do want to mention too quick, we've been talking a lot about nesting and eggs and breeding. Now that's not the only reason why individuals might be back here. Sure, we're looking at a breeding pair right now. <laughs> But this is a great space for inclement weather. If it's ever hurricane season or just nasty, severe weather's coming in, this is a safe place to bring in our birds that live outdoors in for a safe spot to be. Also, this is a great spot for birds that are on the mend. Maybe they just had medical procedure and just kind of need a nice, quiet, comfortable place to hang out. So this is quite the transitional space or it kind of is this revolving door within our bird department right. where mm -hmm. there's constantly animals moving in and out of here. I love that call that they're making right now. Let's go ahead and keep making our way down. Now, Christine, I know we were asked by Connor earlier about what is our rarest species that mm -hmm. we have here at Riverbanks. What would be some of the species that come to mind for you? So we have a few very very endangered species. Yeah. Ballymina that you'll see in here. Sure. I don't know where they're hiding out right now. Looks like in the back. I was going to say, I think they just flew over way to the um, back. So there are actually more Ballyminas in human care than in the wild. Whoa. Okay. Those of you who missed that, Connor, if you missed that, we're talking about the Ballymina. And what Christine just mentioned was there are actually more Ballyminas in human care around the world than there are actually naturally out in the wild. That's devastating to hear. It's about a hundred in, wow. in the wild. Now that is such a great example too of why it is so important to have these sustainable breeding populations. So that way in the case where those hundred aren't thriving in the wild anymore, we have individuals that can be potentially reintroduced back out into the wild. And Bali Minas are a great example of that. Definitely. So these two were paired together through the SSP, sure. the Species Survival Plan. Okay, yep. So we know a whole lot about where they came from and they were a recommended pair. Very neat. Well, and they have such a nice private area back here um, where there's very little distractions. You've given them all the materials. I'm kind of looking around, there's lots of different branches and sticks and great things that if you're a bird, you would want to use to make a nest with. In fact, I, I noticed all this too. <laughs> this is great because this is pretty much 
wanting to have a conducive environment for breeding. Okay, I have to give a shout out that. We gotta bend over here a little bit, go down further to the ground. Who do we have here? So he is our curl crested Arisari. So Arisari, a little bit of a mouthful, kind of looks like a toucan, are they related? They are related, yeah. So they're mm -hmm. part of the same family. Somebody's deciding to hang out on the ground here today, <laughs> but they were just making a little bit of noise, had to give them a quick little shout out. <laughs> Now, as we make our way all the way down here in the hallway, there's our golden-breasted starlings, too, that are kind of zipping all the way around. Mm -hmm. Now, another one of our very rare individuals is our chestnut-backed thrush. They just kind of flew away over there. Now, this is a breeding pair as well, correct? So, this is not actually. So, they oh, are good. Okay. Um, So they are chicks that we had from a pair that was outside on Habitat. Interesting. Okay, another great example then. Mm -hmm. Kind of that revolving door here in the bird center. Some individuals that aren't ready to head to their next home, maybe into another zoo. Mm -hmm. This is kind of a great housing facility that's safe enough for them before maybe they're approved for another breeding pair or maybe before a Habitat is ready for them outside here at Riverbanks. It is great to have such a kind of a modular space. We've kind of gone all the way through the hallway. We wanted to give you a quick peek behind the scenes in our bird center. We learned so much about diets and brooders and raising chicks and incubating their eggs. We wanted to give you this peek behind the scenes into what we call our bird conservation center. I wanna go ahead and quick turn around the camera and say, a big thank you to Christine, of course. Thank you, guys. We couldn't have done it without you, of course. You're the expert here in the area. This is your primary space. So thank you to everybody who sent in all their great questions. But we're going to go ahead and leave Christine to do the rest of her kind of routine this morning. And us, we're going to make our way out of here. So that way we can get you all geared up for the rest of the week of Z learning. So everybody who is tuning in, Today, we wanted to say thanks for taking a break with us yesterday. We are going to have all sorts of Z learning features for you later this week. So I encourage you to tune in. We hope to see you tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. We're gonna actually, tomorrow morning, we're gonna be hanging out inside of our aquarium complex for a very special feeding session. So we're going to be behind the scenes yet again tomorrow. So join us tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. We have a whole lot of features this week. You're not going to want to miss them. But in the meantime, everybody, thanks so much for all your great comments and questions. And we're going to be bringing you more Z-learning through the rest of the week. Thanks so much, everybody. And we'll see you again soon.